Welcome to this online lesson asking the question, why was the Spanish Armada defeated? Our aims in this lesson are to know the causes of an event, in this case the Spanish Armada of 1588, to explain the outcome of an event, and also to evaluate the importance of those causes. Here's a do now task. Have a look at the photograph of the object. Elizabeth I ordered this medal to be made. The writing says, God blew and they were scattered. Only it says it in Latin. What do you think this means? And who is they? And how are they scattered? Look at the medal closely and you might get a few clues. Pause the video while you complete this task and then we'll have a look at what you think. If you look closely at the medal you can see that there is a naval battle going on. I'm not expecting you to be able to see the little crosses on some of the flags but those are actually the old-fashioned uh, flags of Spain. So that is the Spanish Armada. However, if you look right at the top, there are some different crosses and those are the smaller English ships attacking them. Above them, you can see some Hebrew script, which is re representing God and the weather. All of this should become clear by the end, but we shall see. So when it says God blew and they were scattered, the they would be the Spanish and they were scattered by the winds, which of course Elizabethan people would have believed were controlled by God. We're going to start off by having a look at why the Spanish Armada happened in the first place. To help us do this, we're going to have a look at the Tudor family tree, first of all. We're going to start with Henry VIII. Yes, Henry VII came earlier, but he's irrelevant to this particular part of the story, so I've left him out. Henry VIII had several children. His first child was Mary. Mary was the daughter of Henry and Catherine of Aragon, his first wife. His next child was Elizabeth, who later became Elizabeth I. She was the daughter of Henry and Anne Boleyn. That was Henry's second wife. And then his third and final child was Edward VI. He, he was the son of Henry and his third wife, Jane Seymour. Notice, though, that I've added in different arrows to show which particular religion these different people were. Mary Tudor was a Catholic, so I've given her a green line. Elizabeth and Edward were both raised as Protestants. If you're unfamiliar of the conflict between uh, Protestants and Catholics at this time in history, it might well be worth reviewing some of the earlier lessons that I've put together on this. But if you are comfortable, then you should be up to speed by now. It's important to note as well that Mary Tudor also married Philip II of Spain, who was also a Catholic. So ultimately, the Catholic King of Spain was ruling with Mary. Except Spain being a much more important country than England at this time, it's not difficult to imagine who was probably calling the shots in that particular relationship. OK, here's some tasks. Firstly, complete your own version of this family tree. You can also colour code some of the lines to show whether they are Catholics or, Pro or Protestants. Secondly, explain why Henry's children had different religious beliefs. Think about what Henry did to the church during his reign. If you're unfamiliar with this, well, you might want to look back at some information on Henry VIII. Thirdly, explain how this might cause problems for England. And fourthly, why might Mary have married Philip of Spain? Pause the video while you complete those tasks, then press play when you're ready to continue. So let's consider these things one at a time. Hopefully you've drawn your family tree now. But why did these children have different religious beliefs? Well, first of all, Mary Tudor was born first while Henry was still very much a Catholic and Catherine of Aragon remained a Catholic throughout her life. So it makes sense that she would have been raised a Catholic. But remember that Henry broke with the Catholic Church in Rome in order to divorce Catherine of Aragon. This meant that he made steps towards being Protestant. And indeed, Elizabeth was raised mo mostly by Anne Boleyn as a Protestant. And the same can be said for Edward VI, who also ruled as a Protestant in his reign as well. So why might this cause problems? Well, it can show how actually all three of these children did eventually become king or queen of England, and it meant that the nation's religion flip-flopped between them. So it went from Protestant with Edward VI, to Catholic with Mary Tudor, and then back to Protestant again for Elizabeth I. So that caused a huge amount of religious conflict in the country. So why might Mary have married Philip of Spain? Well, she wanted to secure an alliance with the most powerful Catholic country in, the, in all of Europe and therefore secure a Catholic line going forward. In the event, she never had any children with him and that particular attempt failed. But that didn't stop Philip II wanting to have designs on England and taking over if he could. 
So let's consider this event called the Spanish Armada. Who was on each side? On the one side, we've got the English Navy. Their commander-in-chief was Queen Elizabeth I, and her commanders in battle were Sir Francis Drake, who I've pictured there, and Lord Howard. On the other side, we have the Spanish Armada. Armada is just the Spanish word for navy. Their commander-in-chief is King Philip II, and their commander in the battle is the Duke of Medina Sidonia. So why did these people go to war? First of all, let's make a note of each of these sides. Record the information on this particular screen and pause the video while you do so. Press play when you're ready to continue. So now we've seen who is on each side, we're going to have a look at the wider reasons why King Philip II of Spain wanted to invade England and why he launched the Armada. For this task, we're going to use a quick sketch of King Philip II. If you're not a very confident artist, you can also always just write his name. However, whatever you choose to do, leave enough space around the outside so that we can note down his ideas as to why he wanted to invade England. Pause the video while you complete your sketch or your heading, leaving plenty of space around the page in order to make your notes. Let's have a look at the reasons that Philip had for invading. Reasons the Spanish launched an invasion. The Spanish had a big empire and wanted to add England to it and make it Catholic. Remember at this point England had switched back to being Protestant and the Spanish didn't like that. Philip had asked Elizabeth I to marry him, but she had refused. He would invade England and remove Elizabeth from the throne and turn the country into a Catholic one once more. You might notice a bit of a pattern here. Sir Francis Drake, the famous English sailor, had sailed into Spain and set light to 30 of the Spanish ships. This was an event that was jokingly referred to at the time as singeing the King of Spain's beard, but it was a serious humiliation for the Spanish, who in so many respects were far more powerful than the English. They didn't like being humiliated and they wanted revenge. It's worth remembering that Sir Francis Drake was little better than a pirate, really. For years, English sailors had been stealing gold and silver from the Spanish ships. Remember the comparison with uh, Francis Drake being a, a pirate? Well, at the time they were known as privateers. They basically were pirates, but instead of keeping the money for themselves, they used to give most of it to Queen Elizabeth I, who would then reward them for their service. Not much different from a pirate, though. Philip had heard that Elizabeth had executed Mary, Queen of Scots, who was another Catholic. Anyone who killed a Catholic queen should be punished, in his view. Philip was trying to control Holland, but England were helping them. He needed to gain more control. So at this time there is a land fight going on uh, in the Netherlands and uh, the English are supporting the Protestant people in the Netherlands against the Catholic Spanish. So he wants to sort out that war once and for all and get rid of the, uh, the Protestant support in that part of Europe. All right, you can pause the video here and write some ideas around your picture of Philip. As an extension, you could label these re reasons depending on whether they are about religion, power or military reasons, depending on what you think. Some of them might be a mixture of those. Anyway, pause the video now while you do that, and it's really important that you get all of these facts down, or at the very least the vast majority of them, so that you've got enough detail uh, going forward looking at the reasons why the Armada happened. Spend at least 10 to 15 minutes doing this. Done? If you need more time because you haven't written down all the details yet, then obviously use that first. If not, we'll move on. We're now going to consider the two sides in this. England, or rather the British Isles, being islands, are surrounded by the sea. It means that any invading force at this time has to get across the sea first. Only way of doing that, of course, is by ship. So the Spanish Armada and the battle surrounding it is a naval battle, and we need to have a look at the opposing navies. You're about to take some notes on the differences between the two sides. If you're working on paper, you can divide your page into two with headings like this. If you're working on a computer, you can do the same thing. On the one side, you should have the Royal Navy, this is England, under Elizabeth I. And then the other side, we've got the Spanish Armada, under Philip II of Spain. Pause the video while you create your table, and then press play when you're ready to continue. This is a picture of a Spanish galleon. A galleon is a particular type of ship that was large and heavy, at least for the time. Notice that the back and front of it, or the fore and aft of the ship, are raised up. 
These are known as the forecastle and the aftercastle, and just like a castle on land, they're a bit like fortresses floating around in the sea. They were built up high so that archers could rain arrows down onto the decks of other ships, and people could swing down onto them. Here on the other hand, to roughly the same scale, is an English galleon, something that was referred to at the time as a race-built galleon. They were designed to be smaller, and they were designed to be much more manoeuvrable, and much faster. You might be able to see that both ships have got cannon coming out of the sides, but the Spanish cannon, well, there are an awful lot more of them. But that doesn't tell us the full story. You might think just by looking at this that the Spanish galleon would be so much better than the English one. Well, in some respects it was, but it all depends on how you use it. Under the appropriate headings, list as many differences as you can between these two ships to describe what the English galleon is like under the Royal Navy heading and describe what the Spanish galleon is like under the Spanish Armada heading. We're then going to look in more detail as to what these differences really made. Pause the video now and complete those tasks. Let's have a look at the specific detail behind these different ships and what made in some respects the English ones much more suitable for the fight ahead. Here's some more specific detail. The English had around 130 ships but only 60 were ready to fight. The Spanish had 170 galleons which were about 160 feet long and the English ships were only half this size but the English ships were quicker. They also had long range guns, which means that they could shoot further. After all, if you could shoot the enemy, but they couldn't shoot you, you were at a significant advantage. The Spanish ships were clumsy and difficult to steer. They would sail up beside enemy ships and tie themselves to them with ropes and hooks. Then soldiers would jump onto the enemy ships and fight with swords and daggers. The heavy guns at the bottom of the ship would blow huge holes into the sides of the other ships. This was very much how naval forces had fought even before the age of cannon. It was all about capturing the enemy ships, rather than necessarily beating them and sinking them. On the other hand, the English fought differently. The English ships were speedy. Their sailors were able to avoid any enemy attempts to get alongside and board them. Instead, their cannonballs would leave the ships as floating wrecks. Then the English could get on board and finish them off. OK, pause here and add some more specific detail to your table. For example, how big were the ships, how many did they have, and in what style did they fight? Pause the video while you add your detail now. Done? Let's move on. We should by now have got a list of details and we can see some of the differences between the English Royal Navy and the Spanish Armada. Review your information on the opposing navies. In your opinion, which fleet of ships, the English or the Spanish, stood the best chance of success? Write a paragraph to explain your answer using real examples. It might look like this and you can use this writing frame if you need to, but you don't have to. Firstly make a point, the fleet with the best chance of success was, then give an example, an example to support this is, and then explain it, the effect of this was. Then you can link it back to the question. This would have given this fleet the best chance of success because. As an extension you could give the other side as well and add balance to your answer. On the other hand, the other fleet was weaker. An example to support this was, and the effect of this was. This made this fleet weaker because. Okay, use some real examples from your notes from earlier. It should probably only take you about five to 10 minutes to complete this task, so off you go. Done? Well, I wonder which one you thought. For one thing, the Spanish Armada was far larger than the Royal Navy, and this would make it incredibly difficult to beat. In military matters, whoever's got the most soldiers and the most ships, well, they often win. On the other hand, the English ships, despite being smaller, and despite being fewer in number, were better ships in many respects than the Spanish ones. So a lot would depend on how the English used them. We're now going to have a look at the events of the Spanish Armada and who won and why. For this, you'll need a map like this one here. I've included a link in the description to this video where you can find a map that will work for you. If not, you might have been provided with one. However, you'll need to make sure that you've got plenty of space to write some detailed notes around the outside. We're now going to study the three main stages of the battle that we now call the Spanish Armada. On your own copy of this map, you're going to mark the progress of the Armada in these three main stages. The first one happens in the Channel, the next one happens in an, well around Calais and off the coast, and the last one is to the north of the British Isles. You'll indicate the route of the Armada with arrows and also label some key events. 
To start off with though, we're going to label two parts of our map. Obviously I'm going to show this a lot larger on the screen here so you can see it clearly, but you'll want to label this a lot smaller on your own copy of the map. So first of all, get yourself a copy of the map or find out where you can get one. You can pause the video while you do that. Got yourself a map? Okay. First place I want you to label is Cornwall down here. This is the most southwesterly county of England. The next is Calais. This is the French port which is closest to England. So label those on your map and now we're gonna, then we're going to have a look at the first stage of the battle. Press play when you are ready to continue, but for now, pause. Alright, let's have a look at stage one. Stage one, battle in the channel. For this part, you'll want to be concentrating on just the southernmost part of your map, looking at the English Channel. Here it is. I've shown it as a satellite image. Our first event is the Spanish Armada itself. You could draw on a symbol for this if you like. The Spanish Armada actually sailed in a crescent formation like this, which was a very tactical formation. Anyone chasing it might get caught between the two horns around the outside of the crescent and they get fired at from both sides, so it was a very good defensive position. I've included the old Spanish flag here just for clarity of who was on each side. This is what I need you to do now. Indicate where the Spanish were spotted and then make a note. This is what I need you to note down. You can do it either on the map if you have space or elsewhere if you haven't got space. So event number one is that the Spanish Armada was sighted off Lizard Point in Cornwall on July the 19th of 1588. They sailed in a crescent formation which would be hard to attack. The English raised the alarm by lighting a series of beacons, letting Elizabeth know quickly to raise her army. So here's how this worked. One beacon would be lighted at a lookout post on the coast. The other lookout post would not only be watching out for the Spanish ships, but they'd be looking over to their nearest uh, lookout post as well. When they saw the smoke and the flames rising, they would light their own fire, and within a matter of only a few hours, Beacons would be lit all the way across the south coast and up to London, and if those beacons were lit, it meant only one thing. The Spanish had arrived. Some of those beacon stations actually survive to this day. So now the English are aware that the Spanish have turned up. So where is the English Navy? Well, they're in port at Plymouth. Looks like they're in a good position, but it's not as simple as all that. You now need to add on our first arrow showing where the Spanish Armada have moved to. They're progressing down the channel quite nicely. Now I need you to note down the second event. The English fleet was trapped in Plymouth by an incoming tide. When they finally sailed, the fast English ships soon caught up with the lumbering Armada. OK, you can pause the video here and then you can make that note and add some arrows onto your map to show the movements of each side. So, so far the Spanish Armada have been sighted, the message has been sent to London by the signal beacons, and the English have set sail to intercept them. There's a famous, although probably false, story about this, where Sir Francis Drake was so confident of victory that he decided to finish a game of bowls in Plymouth before setting sail. If there's any truth to this story, it's more likely that Drake was actually more um, conscious of the fact that the tide was coming in and that even if he wanted to sail, he wouldn't have been able to. So he might as well finish his game of bowls rather than do anything else. But now the English and the Spanish are about to get into actual combat. For our next stage, there was a running battle up the channel. The fast English ships outmaneuvered the Spanish galleons, which could not get alongside to board them. The longer ranged English guns fired at the Spanish, doing some damage. So now you can label on our next arrow to show the progress of the Spanish Armada and note down event number three, either on your map or elsewhere. Pause the video while you make those notes and add that particular arrow to your map. We're now approaching the end of stage one of the battle. Despite the fighting, the English actually sank no Spanish ships. The Spanish Armada arrived in Calais more or less as planned. All that remained was to pick up the Spanish army that was supposed to be waiting there and bring them to England, whose army was no match for them in both size and quality. So now you need to add on our final arrow of stage one, Battle in the Channel, and note down event number four. This fighting actually lasted for the best part of a week 
and it might seem incredible to us that neither side managed to sh sink any ships. But that's how it was. Plenty of damage done, but not enough to sink any ships, which was very difficult. Okay, pause the video while you get event number four down, and you complete that last arrow on your map. Let's move on to stage two. Stage two, the Battle of Graveline. Notice that I've added two more locations to my map. You'll be able to do this as well. The first location is Tilbury. This is on the Thames estuary on the Essex side, so just north of where the River Thames is going in. Put a mark for Tilbury approximately in the same place on your map. The other is Graveline. It looks like Gravelines, but I'm told it's pronounced Graveline being in France. This is just to the east of Calais, and it was where it was agreed that the Spanish would pick up their army to invade England. That's the whole thing. The Spanish Armada wasn't going to invade England itself. It was merely the armed transport to bring a Spanish army over to England to get rid of Elizabeth I. Pause the video while you add those notes to your map. So let's see where the Spanish Armada had, had weighed anchor. Disaster soon struck for the Spanish. The Duke of Parma's army was not yet at the coast. Clearly he had been held up somewhere. The Duke of Medina Sidonia, in charge of the Armada, had no choice but, to choice but to command the Armada to drop anchor and wait off Graveline, France. The English army massed at Tilbury, waiting. It was time for the English navy to strike. Now, a lot of this is done in hindsight. We know exactly where these different people were at different times. But we've got to remember, with the poor communications at the time, that English army at Tilbury was simply waiting at the most convenient location for a Spanish army to land. And they were nothing like as big as the Spanish army would be. Little did they know that things were actually going really badly wrong for the Spanish. And they simply had to wait for their army to turn up. So, pause the video here and note down event number five and make an indication on your map as to where the Spanish Armada set up anchor. On to the next stage. Hopefully you've worked out by now that these things aren't actually being shown to scale, otherwise those ships would be colossal, wouldn't they? Event number six. At midnight on Jan July the 28th, the Spanish spotted flames approaching. To their horror, they realised that these were English hell burners. The English had loaded up old ships with burning tar, gunpowder and loaded cannons and set them slowly drifting. At that point, they began to explode. Spanish knew that they were under attack and they scattered. But the intention was never really to sink that many Spanish ships. It was more about disorganising them, getting them to panic, getting them out of formation to make it easier to fight them in a moment. And it worked. The Spanish did panic and it must have been a terrifying spectacle. Many of the captains simply commanded that they should uh, cut their anchor ropes and get into any other position and get away from the fire ships. Cutting the anchor rope so that these ships no longer had an anchor would be a costly mistake later in the battle. Pause the video here and make sure you note down event number six. The attack of the fire ships is one of the most important and famous parts of the entire battle. Let's move on to the next event then. The Spanish are now badly out of position and it's time for the English to attack. As day broke, the English ships attacked the Spanish ships, who were scattered and disorganised. They used their superior manoeuvrability and longer range guns to attack and damage the Spanish. The Spanish lost five ships, and then they had to retreat north. After this, what we now call the Battle of Graveline, the plan to pick up the army was no more. OK, on your map you can indicate the attack of the English. Maybe you want to draw a little English flag, flag like I've got on my, uh, on my map here. And you'll need to note down event number seven, the Battle of Graveline and the English breaking up the Spanish attack and getting them to flee to the north. Pause the video now while you make those notes and while you note them down on your map. Now we're going to move on to events elsewhere. 
The Spanish have lost some of their ships, they can no longer pick up their soldiers at Graveline, and they're having to retreat. But none of this was known in England. Their mission ruined the defeated Spanish could not fight the winds and tides and retreated north to take the long route back to Spain. Later, on August the 8th, still unaware of the defeat of the Armada, Elizabeth inspired her outnumbered army with something called the Tilbury Speech. I've included a dramatisation uh, of this in a link in the description to this video, which you can watch if you wish. However, the most famous line from this inspiring speech, which seems pretty sexist by today's standards but at the time would have been incredibly brave, was this. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too, and think foul scorn that Palmer or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. It was an inspiring speech, and Elizabeth is, Elizabeth's mo mostly outnumbered and outclassed army at Tilbury probably needed those brave and defiant words if they were going to have a fight. Luckily for the English, they would never need to do that fight, because the Spanish we're turning tail for home. So all you need to do now is note down event number eight and draw an arrow indicating that the Spanish Armada is retreating north. And then we're going to move on to the third stage of the Spanish Armada. Pause the video while you complete your notes. Let's see how it ended. Despite Elizabeth's stirring words, and despite the bravery and innovation of Drake and Howard, the English sailors were not rewarded. Typhus swept through the cramped and uncomfortable ships, and few men were ever paid at all. No way to reward the nation's saviours. OK, make a note of how it ended for the English before we have a look at how it ended for the Spanish. Pause the video, complete your notes, and then we'll move on. Stage three. So it didn't end all that happily for the English sailors, but at least they had won. I've called this stage God Blue and they were scattered. Remember that from the medal at the start. Well, here's what it means. We're going to focus on the area of your map to the west of Ireland and also to the north of Scotland for here. Event number 10. The defeated Spanish Armada had not suffered the last of its misfortunes yet. The winds meant that they could not take the short route back through the English Channel, back the way they came. Instead, they had to sail the long way round, north of Scotland and west into the Atlantic. OK, indicate with arrows the route of the Armada so far, and note down event number 10. Pause the video while you do that. Things are about to go even more badly wrong, though. And bear in mind, they would have been running out of food and water by this point. Event number 11 relates to the arrival of a violent summer storm. A violent summer storm blew up over the Atlantic. Sailing was hazardous at the best of the times in the 16th century, but many of the Armada's ships had let, left their anchors back at Graveline in the panic to escape the fire ships, and they'd also been wrecked and also damaged by other fighting battles. They were powerless to resist being blown onto deadly rocks in Western Ireland and Scotland. Of the 170 ships that set out, only 67 of the Spanish Armada ships returned to Spain. The Spanish lost around 20,000 men in the failed invasion and would never succeed in conquering England until peace was agreed in 1604. I should point out that 1604 is after Elizabeth had died. So a very sad end for the Spanish Armada. Those men blown ashore were often drowned. Those that managed to actually make it to shore, well, sometimes they settled and they lived there. Other times they were taken prisoner. And sometimes they were simply beaten to death by the inhabitants who found them, knowing that they were the enemy. OK, indicate the storm blowing up on your map, the wrecked ships, which you can draw on your map too, and make a note of event number 11, the Spanish Armada being wrecked. And that's the end of the Battle of the Spanish Armada. And what was left of the Spanish sailed home. You can add your final arrow onto the map now. 
If you need to review any of these events, then please do so. Skip back in the video and remember you can pause it wherever you need to to add accuracy and detail to your notes. But that gives us an overview of what happened. So, God blew and they were scattered. To make sure that you've got the main details that you need, I've put them up on the screen here, but they are all out of order. See if you can record them in chronological order from earliest to latest. Pause the video while you do that and press play and we'll see the answers. Our first event is this one. 170 Spanish ships set out sailing in a crescent shape that the English would find hard to attack. The Spanish were spotted off the coast of Cornwall. Drake followed them for a week but could not sink a, sink a single ship. The Spanish arrived at Calais. They waited for soldiers to join them, but they did not arrive. Drake attacked with fire ships, boats filled with straw, gunpowder and pig fat. Frightened by the fire ships, the Spanish scattered. The English attacked off Graveline. And the Spanish fled. A storm hit their ships and they struggled home. Some sank. Here are those events again, this time in the correct order. Your tasks then. Review the events of the Spanish Armada. Which events were down to Spanish mistakes? Which events were down to English skill? And which events were down to chance? They might be a mixture. Lastly, out of these three, three factors, Spanish mistakes, English skill and chance, which also means luck, decide which was the most important and rank them from most to least important. Pause the video while you do that and then we'll go through which factors each of these events relate to. So 170 uh, ships set out sailing in a crescent shape that the English would find difficult to attack. Well which one does that best fit? It probably is closest to Spanish mistakes because at the end of the day the formation didn't really make too much odds. Or you could put it down to English skill because although it was difficult to attack the English did manage it. Secondly the Spanish were spotted off the coast of Cornwall. Drake followed them for a week but could not sink a single ship. Although this might seem particularly unfortunate for the English, actually it shows some of their skill. They did manage to follow them and keep up with them, and they did spot them in time to do something about it. Thirdly, the Spanish arrived in Calais. They wait for soldiers to join them, but they do not arrive. Very clearly a Spanish mistake. Then Drake attacked with the fire ships. That's very much an English skill. Then frightened by the fire ships, the Spanish scattered, and then the English were able to attack. That's probably a mixture between Spanish mistakes and English skill. And lastly, the Spanish fleeing. Well, the English could not control the weather, could they? The fact that they were wrecked was simply down to chance. Bad luck on the part of the Spanish. Now we're going to put it all together in our main question. Explain why the Spanish Armada failed. Your task is to answer this question based on the information you have gathered. You should structure your answer as followed. Make a point. One reason the Spanish Armada failed is because the Spanish made mistakes. An example of a Spanish mistake is, and the effect of this was, this led to the failure of the Armada because. This structure of paragraph is what I often call a peel paragraph. You make a point, you give an example, you explain it, and then you link it back to the question explaining why the Spanish Armada failed. When you write it as a full paragraph, you don't need to write the headings point, example, explain, and link. So try and write it as a full paragraph with complete sentences. However, we're not going to just going to stick to the Spanish mistakes. We're now then going to complete a point, example, explain and link paragraph for the other factors too, English skill and chance. And then you conclude. In conclusion, the main reason that the Spanish Armada failed is, and this is where you give your opinion, this reason is most important because, and again, that's based upon your opinion. So that's a total of four short paragraphs that you'll need to write for that answer. It'll take you a good 20 minutes, maybe even half an hour, depending on how slowly you write. You can use the point example, explain and link paragraphs if you want to, but you absolutely should include examples of English skills, Spanish weaknesses and chance and luck as well before concluding overall and saying which of those three things was the most important in your view. Okay, pause the video here and then we'll move on. Hopefully you've finished your answer and come up with your opinion. 
Let's do a final knowledge check. See if you can answer these questions based upon your notes, or better still, from memory. Firstly, who had Philip II been married to? Secondly, give two reasons why Philip wanted to invade England. Three, give one way that the Armada was more powerful than the English Navy. Four, give one way English ships were better than the Spanish ships. And five, where did the Spanish try to pick up troops on their way to England? Pause the video while you complete those tasks. Let's have a look at some answers then. Who had Philip II been married to? It was Mary Tudor, or Mary I. Give two reasons why Philip wanted to invade England. Well, there's several you could choose from here, but as some suggestions, he wanted to expand his empire, he wanted to make England Catholic, it might have been revenge for English raids. There are others too. Give one way that the Armada was more powerful than the English Navy. Well, the most obvious one was that they had more ships, their ships were bigger, and they had a bigger army. But give one way that the English ships were better than the Spanish ships. Again, several suggestions here, but they were faster, they were more manoeuvrable, and they had better guns. You might also uh, argue that they were better led too. So where did the Spanish try and pick up troops on their way to England? It was at Calais, although the battle happened off Gravelines, so if you put that, you can give yourself the mark. And on that note, we've now finished this lesson on the Spanish Armada, so thanks very much for taking part. I hope it's been interesting and useful to you, and if it has, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. But until next time, adios.